Welcome to the Chaos Sector. We return to the Matrix. We called it before it happened. It was inevitable. Tim Walls fell on his face in the vice presidential debate, and if it had been perhaps another 30 minutes or so, he might have lost his cool and flipped out due to the pressure. You know why Walls was so nervous? You want to know what he was really frightened of? It was his military service, stolen valor, a disgrace to the men and women who served their country. On the national stage in that debate, being confronted by a fellow military service member in Vance, he was shitting his pants. But Vance spared him. He showed the old scoundrel mercy, and Walls definitely sent him a thank you letter after the debate. But Walls wasn't safe, because to everyone's surprise, the CBS moderators threw cold water on his face, shocking him with a question regarding his military service and foreign relations overseas. Now, we will pick points out of the debate to highlight because there was a lot of blabbering going on. Ironically though, in contrast, I believe this was a better debate overall than the Trump-Harris debate and obviously the Trump-Biden debate. The reason I say this is because for one, Trump wasn't on the stage, so the moderators couldn't take out their vitriol against him. Also, vice presidents actually focus more on the policies directly, to be honest. At this point, we will highlight a section of the debate transcript regarding Walls visiting Hong Kong during protest of 1989. Margaret Brennan, quote, we have a lot to get to a hedge on, on many topics, but right now I want to talk about personal qualifications. The vice president is often the last voice the president hears before making consequential decisions. We want to ask you about your leadership qualities, Governor Walls. You said you were, you were in Hong Kong during the Tiananmen Square protest in the spring of 1989, but Minnesota Public Radio and other media outlets are reporting that you actually didn't travel to Asia until August of that year. Can you explain that discrepancy? You have two minutes. Unquote. Tim Walls responds. Quote, yeah. Well, and to the folks there who didn't get at the top of this, look, I grew up in small rural Nebraska, town of 400, town that you your bike with your buddies till the streetlights come on, and I'm proud of that service. Wait, let's stop right here. You notice anything familiar with this answer? It's Waltz's version of a word salad. And since he likes to talk so much, wait, he's literally spitting out pieces of lettuce and tomatoes at an alarming rate. Can you explain that discrepancy, was the question. And his first words in response were, yeah. Meaning, he will explain the discrepancy to the American people. But right after that, he didn't actually explain the discrepancy. He went on to blabber about nothing, deflecting from the question. Politicians dance around. It's nothing new. But there are different dynamics to how and why one would shuffle their feet around a question. In his response, he is defending against the claims he lied, before explaining why there was a discrepancy, you see? Although he agreed to explain the discrepancy by saying, yes, I will clear it up, he actually went into defense mode by deflecting from the question, which means he has basically been deemed a liar even before he can get to the actual reason for the discrepancy. But let's continue with his explanation of that discrepancy. Quote, I joined the National Guard at 17, worked on family farms, and then I used the GI Bill to become a teacher. Passionate about it, a young teacher. My first year out, I got the opportunity in the summer of 89 to travel to China 35 years ago, be able to do that. I came back home and then started a program to take young people there." Unquote. Now, after all of this blabbering, he is yet to explain the discrepancy of claiming to be in Hong Kong during the deadly protest, June of 1989. His records show he didn't arrive until August of that year. So this is an example of Walls building a wall of defense against something that seems a bit minor at face value, but lying about witnessing or being present during a deadly protest goes to what? Your character which Margaret Brennan is inquiring about, remember? So to dance around it, instead of just saying you got the months mixed up, it was 35 years ago. I apologize for any misrepresentation or misinformation. You see how hard is that to do? But because he didn't get the months mixed up, he is defending against his lies that haven't been proven yet. It's considered a quote discrepancy at this point. Let's continue. Quote, we would take basketball teams. We would take baseball teams. We would take dancers and we would go back and forth to China. The issue for that was, was to try and learn. Now look, my community knows who I am. They saw where I was at. They, look, I will be the first to tell you I have poured my heart into my community. I've tried to do the best I can, but I've not been perfect. 
And I'm a knucklehead at times, but it's always been about that. Those same people elected me to Congress for 12 years. And in Congress, I was one of the most bipartisan people, working on things like farm bills that we got done, working on veterans' benefits. And then the people of Minnesota were able to elect me to governor twice. Unquote. Again, the lettuce and tomatoes are all over his suit and tie. They're all over the debate stage because this is the biggest bowl of word salad you might see in your life. You know what his response actually is to the question? One phrase. Quote, I'm a knucklehead, unquote. Meaning at the time he was lying about it, Waltz was attempting to boost his reputation as a military veteran and tell the tales of experiencing many events across the world, hoping to impress everyone listening to his garbage. He is a pathological liar, but he is also all the other types of liars balled into one. A pathological liar lies to boost their egos, seek sympathy, their reality becomes entangled with their lies, they exaggerate a story or don't tell the truth about what they had for breakfast. I mean, that's just, in Walz's words, that's just weird. Pathological liars believe in their lies to the point they actually believe they're true. A liar can only tell the truth when the truth covers up the lie. Yep, let's continue. Hopefully within this tangent, he will actually admit he lied. I mean, at least admit you got the time frame mixed up. Quote, so look, my commitment has been from the beginning to make sure that I'm there for the people, to make sure that I get this right. I will say more than anything. Many times I will talk a lot. I will get caught up in the rhetoric. But being there, the impact it made, the difference it made in my life. I learned a lot about China. I hear the critiques of this. I would make the case that Donald Trump should have come on one of those trips with us. I guarantee you he wouldn't be praising Xi Jinping about Clover. And I guarantee you he wouldn't start a trade war that he ends up losing. Okay, now we have analyzed all of this. And Walls still hasn't explained the discrepancy about the 1989 protest in Hong Kong. If he were in the interrogating room, where he claimed he was somewhere on June 19th of 1989, and there was a murder that took place on August 12th, 1989, and it is discovered that he was actually in that area on August 12th instead of June 19th, what do you think the detectives would think? That's right, he is a potential suspect in that murder and they will keep digging until they can confirm if he is in fact a suspect. Walls is incapable of admitting he lied because it strikes down his quality of character. And that's just the tip of the iceberg because he is already in hot water about lying about his military service. You see, that's why it's hard for him to answer the question and explain what happened because he is standing aside from a military veteran who he feels disgraced in front of despite being 20 years his senior. Mentioning Donald Trump in response to the question about his character shows how cowardly Walls truly is. And the man standing next to him gave him a bit of elder mercy, but I think that was the time to flat out go for the jugular. Make Walls speechless, and the debate would be the biggest meltdown of a political candidate in the history of politics. And it shows that Vance has class and courtesy. Because if that were Trump standing aside from Walls, you better believe Trump would have exposed him for his disgrace. Perhaps not the 2024 Trump, but the 2016 Trump would show no mercy. Let's just keep going through this salad bar. Quote, so this is about trying to understand the world. It's about trying to do the best you can for your community. And then it's putting yourself out there and lettucing. Or wait, it says letting, letting your folks understand what it is. My commitment where it be through teaching, which I was good at, or whether it was being a good soldier or was being a good member of Congress, those are the things that I think are the values that people care about." Unquote. Okay, this is the most stubborn jackass ever, but it's his subliminal admission of guilt in lying about being somewhere when you weren't. And it's just making a mountain out of a mole because he has a benefit of the doubt card he can use. It was long ago, you know, I mixed up the months I just remember it was hot, and I couldn't remember exactly when I arrived, but I did go there. Bingo, it's settled. Some may still think you're lying, but at least you gave an explanation for the discrepancy. He's pleading the fifth on it by not providing an answer. Put that into perspective. Were you or were you not at the Tiananmen Square in June of 1989? Uh, I plead the fifth. I'm from a small town in Nebraska, and, and I joined the National Guard when I was 17 years old. So, uh, were you or were you not there? I plead the fifth to that question. 
Hmm. To the moderator's credit, they did follow up on it and force him to answer the question. Margaret Brennan, quote, Governor, just to follow up on that, the question was, can you explain the discrepancy? Wald's quote, no. All I said on this was, is I got there that summer and misspoke on this. So I will just, that's what I've said. So I was in Hong Kong and China during the democracy protest, went in, and from that, I learned a lot of what needed to be in governance, unquote. Now this is a distorted answer with a sprinkling of an explanation, but it's covered in a bunch of unnecessary words to just explain himself. If we take his explanation of the discrepancy here and go all the way back to the initial question, the debate moves on to the next issue. Here's a bit of readjusting. Margaret Brennan asked the question about the discrepancy, and here's the response from Walls. I got there that summer and misspoke on this, so I will just, that's what I've said. So I was in Hong Kong and China during the democracy protest, blah, blah, blah. Now, now why in the hell was that so hard to do? Quick, direct response, cleared up the discrepancy, at least by giving some type of explanation, and then you move on to the next debate topic or issue. But because Vance was living rent-free in his head at that moment, he felt extreme pressure to make himself seem like a noble military veteran with all the other irrelevant crap to lull everyone to sleep from the intensity of questioning his character, which is also associated with his character as a military veteran. Also, Wald stumbled around because if he initially gave that response 20 fucking minutes ago, he would feel it doesn't satisfy the American people. It doesn't satisfy the military veterans staring at him with eyes of contempt, and he wasn't sure if that answer would, would satisfy the moderators neither. Walls had a nervous breakdown, and when people break down this way, they ramble and ramble on in response to a simple question. Okay, he was cooked, but there's more, of course. Now, I want you to examine how CBS takes a tragedy of Hurricane Helene and transforms it into climax change talking points. I'll let my colleague have a bit of fun with it. If anyone checks the newsfeed, Tim Walls is all over the front pages. And it's not because he had a great performance. We all know that. It just keeps magnifying that Ticket is not organized, not even firm on policies. And Walls himself is not even sure about Harris's policies, because she's not even sure about Harris's policies. So you have a disorganized, dysfunctional Ticket in front of the American voters. He did Harris no favors, and she desperately needed one. But let's continue because it was clear CBS was trying to help Walls, yet it was completely futile. Nora O'Donnell, quote, let's turn now to Hurricane Helene. The storm could become one of the deadliest on record. More than 160 people are dead and hundreds more are missing. Scientists say climax change makes these hurricanes larger, stronger, and more deadly because of the historic rainfall. Senator Vance, according to CBS News polling, seven in 10 Americans and more than 60% of Republicans under the age of 45 favor the U.S. taking steps to try and reduce climax change. Senator, what responsibility would the Trump administration have to try and reduce the impact of climax change? I'll give you two minutes, unquote. These are talking points because O'Donnell mentions Republicans in connection to a tragedy. Now, what she is alluding to here is Republicans don't believe in climax change. So essentially, they are responsible for the deaths of those people due to the hurricane. Yep, see right through the sickness. I'll let people in on a little secret. If they don't know, CBS, NBC, ABC, these are the worst. They are worse than CNN and MSNBC. It's not even close. You know why? Because they have this monotone, like robotic way of being dishonest. It's like they're not even human. At least with the cable news networks, you can see through their bullshit, even though they try to stick to the script. The national news networks are like automatons reporting news. They present such ridiculously framed questions in a casual and subtle manner. There is no emotion in how they're moderating. It's literally moderated by two robots. Instead of asking what can be done to actually help those citizens, such as investing more in emergency aid, providing grocery stores with emergency packages that can be sold during the hurricane season, you know, asking if the Trump administration would be willing to give local and state government more emergency funding prior to the hurricane season. You know, just basic and direct questions in regards to the topic discussed. Rather, uses the hurricane and the tragedy that followed allude to it being caused by climax change, with no scientific proof, by the way, and attack Republicans for not supporting efforts in investing into climax change research and development, which is basically holding Republicans accountable for the tragedy. 
Well, what about the millions, billions, and even trillions of dollars that have already been invested into the issue? If I'm not mistaken, the current administration just spent $391 billion on climax change, and it was projected to spend about $738 billion in total. Where has all that money gone, if not to the efforts of, quote, reducing carbon emissions, reducing pollution in many states across the country? Has any of the money invested into this so-called effort had an impact? Nope, despite whatever bogus statistics so-called climax scientists vomit out there for justification. And what about the other countries who are required to invest into this agreement? The Trump administration withdrew from the agreement in 2020, but of course, old Joe and the dipshits who love to throw away money re-entered the following year. Now, of course, Trump believed that every other nation a part of the agreement weren't paying their share into the global investment, felt that the United States was getting ripped off, being pushed out in front to pay the most, and decided to withdraw from the agreement. And guess what started to happen? A global temper tantrum from world elites. We know what happened in 2020, and it was also used to get Trump out of office because he exposed the scam, along with national scams as well. But mentioning Republicans who support efforts in investing in climax change is making it political instead of nonpartisan. The reason, of course, is to allude to Republicans being indirectly responsible for the hurricane. And that is absolutely disgusting from the moderator. But Vance answered it with class and composure. Quote, sure. So first of all, let's start with the hurricane, because it's an unbelievable, unspeakable human tragedy. I just saw today actually a photograph of two grandparents on a roof with a six-year-old child, and it was the last photograph ever taken of them, because the roof collapsed and those innocent people lost their lives. And I'm sure Governor Walls joins me in saying, our hearts go out to those innocent people, our prayers go out to them. And we want as robust and aggressive as a federal response as we can get to save as many lives as possible. And then of course, afterwards, to help the people in those communities rebuild. I mean, these are communities that I love. Some of them I know very personally. In Appalachia, all across the Southeast, they need their government to do their job. Now what Vance cunningly did here is first focus on the tragedy itself, as opposed to addressing some fucking climax change bullshit that was forced into the discussion for a political attack against Vance's party. He sent the compassionate message to the American people and also pivoted away from the mudslinging of the moderators. But because it was a loaded question, attempting to trap him into either rejecting or supporting climax change funding, he of course went on to address it. Quote, and I commit that when Donald Trump is president again, the government will put the citizens of this country first when they suffer from a disaster. And Nora, you asked about climax change. I think this is a very important issue. Look, a lot of people are justifiably worried about all these crazy weather patterns. I think it's important for us, first of all, to say, Donald Trump and I support clean air and clean water. We want the environment to be cleaner and safer. But one of the things that I've noticed, some of our Democratic friends talking a lot about, is a concern about carbon emissions. This idea that carbon emissions drives all the climax change. Well, let's just say that's true. Just for the sake of argument. So we're not arguing about weird science. Let's just say that's true. Well, if you believe that, what would you, what would you want to do? The answer is that you'd want to reshore as much American manufacturing as possible, and you'd want to produce as much energy as possible in the United States of America, because we're the cleanest economy in the entire world. Now, before we continue, Vance has provided a plan that he believes will produce cleaner air and water due to bringing back American manufacturing. Now, the claim that the United States is the cleanest economy, well, that's inaccurate. But the United States is growing in the production of renewable energy, which does help with pollution. So that's a fact check. Let's continue though. Quote, what have Kamala Harris policies actually led to? More energy production in China, more manufacturing overseas, more doing business in some of the dirtiest parts of the entire world. When I say that, I mean the amount of carbon emissions they're doing per unit of economic output. So if we actually care about getting cleaner air and cleaner water, the best thing to do is double down and invest in American workers and the American people. And unfortunately, Kamala Harris has done exactly the opposite." Unquote. 
Now, Vance provided a solution, bringing back American manufacturing and the increase in renewable energy as a key component as well, that is an effective plan to invest into climax change. But again, he could have challenged it a bit by addressing the billions of dollars that have been spent, and yet there is no evidence that any of that money has made a difference. And if it were so important, you wouldn't have nations withdrawing from the Paris Agreement, right? They're withdrawing because their financial investments have not changed anything. Keep in mind, out of the 190 countries, the United States consistently pledges more money annually than other countries. Trump basically stated that other countries need to pay their fair share. Being a businessman, Trump realized that you can cut some of that funding, reinvest back into the United States, and revitalize the economy. I mean, isn't that common sense? Let me put it this way, on a small scale, you have 19 people who have decided to open up a business. Out of the 19, one person has invested 70% towards the business, while others chip in with smaller amounts. But the other business partners feel that that person should invest the most because they have so much money to invest with. But that doesn't mean you avoid paying a fair share, because if we apply this to profit sharing, this person gets 70% return on the investment and everyone else can squirm around getting the crumbs. In other words, what is the return investment on it if the United States hasn't seen any real change for that investment? A global pyramid scheme, by the globalists, of course. If you want to get rid of gas-powered vehicles, then you get rid of gas stations, convenience stores, and the biggest question, what the hell do you do with the oil that's fracked from the land? You leave it there? So you shut down all of the oil companies in the United States. You shut down all of plants, I mean, you literally decimate one of the biggest source of energy in the United States. And let's be honest, this is what the left is proposing, but they won't just come out and say it. You need these resources to even power electric vehicles. Think about it. Some spoiled brat pioneered the environmentalist movement, became a global superstar. Yet, uh, other youth who voice real concerns about their communities, their safety, their education, their freedom, oh, you know, you're not important. If you put it into perspective, the globalists hide behind a child because they know their scam is more impactful and convincing when you plaster an ignorant child in front of the world. And it's somewhat unfair to Greta because in 20 years or so, when she's all grown up and nothing has changed in regards to climax change, she will be heavily scrutinized for being the voice for their movement. Heck, she already has faced that scrutiny. I wouldn't be surprised if she writes a tell-all book and say it was all a sham exposing the lies where the globalists simply carried out their sinister plans of stealing money from the world so they can stay rich and in power. Then, of course, she will be censored for telling the truth, and she'll fade away into the shadows shunned by the very society that lifted her up when she was a little girl, gave her a taste of the global power and influence. Then when she exposes the truth, they kick her to the curb. That's the life of a puppet, though. I'll tell you what the real agenda is. It's to make the United States go bankrupt. Yes. Now, Vance was consistent in keeping the focus on the current administration's flaws and failures, while effectively answering all loaded and biased questions from the two androids. Walls was allowed to respond, but there's no need to get his opinion on climax change. We already know what he thinks. Instead, we touch on the border. Now, this was another sweating bullets moment for Tim Walls, because there is not much real estate for him to wiggle around with in regards to the border. Oh wait, I forgot the moderators are asking the questions, so of course it will be framed in a way that helps him out, but how much? Let's find out. Margaret Brennan quote, we're gonna turn now to immigration. The crisis at the US-Mexico border consistently ranks as one of the top issues for American voters. Okay, so wait, if they are claiming this ranks as one of the top issues for American voters, then why would they frame it in a way that doesn't actually address, you know, never mind, let's keep going. Senator Vance, you're campaigning to carry out the largest mass deportation plan in American history and to use the US military to do so. You see, now even with the moderator framing it this way, it still has to stay within the context of the American voters concerns, but that damn magic pixie dust does wonders. Anyway, could you be more specific about exactly how this will work? For example, would you deport parents who have entered the U.S. illegally and separate them from any of their children who were born on U.S. soil? 
You have two minutes, unquote. No, I have two minutes, but I might not need it. Framing the question in the scope of separating families is a cunning tactic, but I'll explain the most common reason for that scenario. First of all, notice how the android just bypassed the fact that the parent entered the country illegally? Yeah, let's just ignore that, even though you admit there is a crisis at the border, cause and effect, but you know, let's just ignore the cause and focus on the effect. You have two illegal immigrants who have a child on U.S. soil. Yep, there's the complication in a nutshell. This is commonly known as a quote, anchor baby. It's when a child born in the United States has citizenship and the parents usurp that birthright for their own pathway to citizenship. This is a major problem that does in fact cause a major legal headache. And let's be honest, this is done intentional in most cases, meaning those illegal immigrant parents are very malicious in forcing the hand of the United States government to accept the child and by default accept the parents without them having to go through the legal process of becoming citizens. In fact, by federal law, a child must be 21 years of age to petition on behalf of their parents, which means those parents would have to wait 21 years to use the child's citizenship status to improve their own immigration status. Now, why would they create this law, you ask? Because anchor babies is not something new. It has been going on for decades. Some find that term offensive. But how offensive is it to use your child as a way to usurp acceptance into the country instead of being an adult that will go through the legal process? Mind you, applying for citizenship is faster this way than waiting 21 years to possibly obtain citizenship. You want to know why they would rather use the anchor baby strategy? Because they never intended on becoming U.S. citizens in the first place, yet use their children as a way to stay in the country. Also, as we all know, the Obama administration created the cages, deported millions of illegal immigrants, including entire families. And guess what? He was a Democrat who committed these, quote, cr crimes against humanity. No, wait, he's a Democrat, so it doesn't count. But let's try to continue. Vance responds quite well. Quote, so first of all, Margaret, before we talk about deportation, we have to stop the bleeding. We have a historic immigration crisis because Kamala Harris started and that she wanted to undo all of Donald Trump's border policies. Now that was a strategic and intelligent response. Before talking about deportations, which they're alluding to it being racist, Vance points out that the United States has to stop the bleeding, meaning enforce the laws on the books that currently exist, which this administration violated. That's to keep the moderator in check. Then of course he pointed out that Kamala Harris is primarily responsible for the immigration crisis at the border. But let's keep going. 94 executive orders suspending deportations, decriminalizing illegal aliens, massively increasing the asylum fraud that exists in our system that has opened the floodgates. And what it's meant is that a lot of fentanyl is coming into our country. I had a mother who struggled with opioid addiction and has gotten clean. I don't want people who are struggling with addiction to be deprived of their second chance because Kamala Harris let in fentanyl into our communities at record levels. So you've got to stop the bleeding. You've got to re-implement Donald Trump's border policies, build the wall, re-implement deportations. And that, and that gets me to your point, Margaret, about what do we actually do? So we've got 20 to 25 million illegal aliens who are here in the country. What do we do with them? I think the first thing that we do is start with the criminal migrants. About a million of those people have committed some form of crime in addition to crossing the border illegally. I think you start with deportations on those folks, and then I think you make it harder for illegal aliens to undercut the wages of American workers. A lot of people will go home if they can't work for less than minimum wage in our own country. Now, Vance is referring to here is illegal immigrants will just go back home if companies won't be able to hire them paying them less than minimum wage. Let's continue. And by the way, that'll be good for our workers who just want to earn a fair wage for doing a good day's work. And the final point, Margaret, is you ask about family separation. Right now in this country, Margaret, we have 320,000 children that the Department of Homeland Security has effectively lost. Some of them have been sex trafficked. Some of them hopefully have homes with their families. Some of them have been used as drug trafficking mules. The real family separation policy in this country is unfortunately Kamala Harris's wide open southern border. And I'd ask my fellow Americans to remember when she came into office, she said she was gonna do this. 
real leadership would be saying, quote, you know what? I screwed up. We're going to go back to Donald Trump's border policies, unquote. I wish that she would do that. It would be good for all of us. Okay, brilliant response. It covered every aspect of the loaded bias question from the robot moderator, get the border secure, get the illegal immigrants with criminal records out, and then head to the negotiating table to discuss the issue of family chains. Now, although he didn't provide a direct solution to that problem, he explained how you can actually weed out most of the chaos surrounding it. So at least you can figure that out, which is not an easy task. And he was honest about it. Yet, this is what the left is using to keep the illegal immigrants in the country. But by the numbers, there are large numbers of unaccompanied minors, such as approximately 300,000 minors, that Mayorkas apparently don't know where the hell these children are. Oh, but they can keep track of all the children born in the country by illegal immigrant parents, though. Oh, okay. So the Android moderators are effectively tap dancing around the actual core problem, and that's mass illegal immigration. And to be honest, just mass immigration in general. Everyone can come to the consensus that if you have millions of immigrants come into your country, it will put a strain on resources. Those resources are reserved for citizens of the country, who need them, and in some cases desperately need them. In a small town such as Springfield, Ohio, which has been controversial over the past month, is a prime example. A town of approximately 60,000 residents need those local and state resources. But if the federal government brings in close to 20,000 Haitian migrants, now local and state resources have to be allocated to assisting them. There's nothing wrong with helping, but the problem is citizens are the priority first. And you know, people will say, oh, American citizens already have the privilege of freedom, opportunities, and anyone suffering in America is just lazy. Foreigners come to the country and make a way, so why can't those citizens that are homeless do the same, etc.? cetera? I, I agree with the core of that perspective. But it's not that simple. And everyone knows that. You have drug addicts, you have families broken down due to drug addicts. Some had great jobs. But then the business shut down, some have been laid off. Divorce creates financial hardships as well. There are many factors to that. Yet, we don't want to justify violations of the law. But let's continue. Tim Walls has a go at it. Margaret Brennan, quote, Governor, do you care to respond to any of those specific allegations, including that the vice president is, quote, letting in fentanyl and using kids as drug mules, among other things, unquote. Oh, okay. Before we get to the wounded soldier, this is astonishing. Do you see how Brennan framed that scenario? Kamala Harris is using kids as drug mules. Yes, that is how she framed it. Now this is horrible moderating, but the crazy part, well, if we go by the facts, Kamala Harris literally let kids be used as drug mules by her policies of allowing illegal immigrants into the country, including violent criminals and those who are already in the country selling those drugs. But let's continue. Tim Wald states, quote, yeah, well, Margaret Brennan regarding children, Tim Walls responds, quote, the drug mule is not true, but I will say about this. Uh, wait, it is true. Children have been used as drug smugglers into the United States. You see, if you deny the truth, how can you tell the truth? And the reason he quickly moved on from that is because he knows that his opponent is ready to fire back at him with statistics. And I mean, everyone knows it anyway. Brennan asked him about the children being used as drug smugglers by cartels, and he quickly refuted it, and attempted to move on. He didn't provide any proof that it wasn't true, yet he is refuting it. If you refute something, then you have to prove the contrary with facts. You can't just say, oh, that's not true. Anywho, but I will say about this, about the fentanyl, because this is a crisis of this, the opioid crisis. And the good news on this is the last 12 months saw the largest decrease in opioid deaths in our nation's history, 30% decrease in Ohio but there's still more work to do. But let's go back to this on immigration. Kamala Harris was the attorney general of the largest state and a border state in California. She's the only person in this race who prosecuted transnational gangs for human trafficking and drug interventions. But look, we all wanna solve this. Most of us wanna solve this. Hmm, that's an interesting choice of words. He states most of us want to solve this. So he's actually saying there are some out there who don't wanna solve the opioid crisis. I wonder who those individuals could be. Let's continue. And that is the United States Congress. That's the Border Patrol agents. That's the Chamber of Commerce. That's most Americans out there. 
Wait, so is Tim Walls suggesting that some Americans out there don't want to solve the opioid crisis? Listen to his choice of words because it's telling the truth about his ideology. That's why we had the fairest and toughest bill on immigration that this nation's seen. It was crafted by a conservative senator from Oklahoma, James Lankford. I know him. He's super conservative, but he's a man of principles, wants to get it done. Democrats and Republicans worked on this piece of legislation. The Border Patrol said, this is what we need in here. There are the experts. And the Chamber of Commerce and the Wall Street Journal said, pass this thing. Kamala Harris helped get there. 1,500 new border agents, detection for drugs, DOJ money to speed up these adjudications on this, just what Americans want. But as soon as it was getting ready to pass and actually tackle this, Donald Trump said no, told them to vote against it because it gives him a campaign issue. Okay, stop, this is ridiculous. I can't believe that they are running with that narrative. So what Walls and Democrats are pathetically suggesting is that all of those so-called plans would decrease illegal immigration. Fucking negative. He never stated anything about decreasing illegal immigration. Would the bill crack down on murderers and rapists? Fucking negative. He never stated anything about decreasing those crimes. Of course, we reviewed that bill and it was nothing but a bunch of money sent to foreign countries, but they called it, guess what? Guess what they had the nerve to call it? The fucking border security bill. Proposed to spend $118 billion, but only $20 billion on border security, $60 billion in aid to Ukraine, and the rest was allocated to other foreign countries, including an additional $10 billion to Ukraine. So when you call something a border security bill, but the spending makes up less than 25% of $118 billion, why the hell would any sane person approve of that bill if they are fighting to secure the border? Oh, you know, we're not actually trying to secure the border. The money spent on it is more of, well, it's consolation spending. So, you know, we're just trying to help out, but we have other priorities. Then why the fuck did you call the bill border security then? Hey, these people are con artists. They're trying to deceive you. Stop them. Arrest them now. Arrest those criminals. Don't let them get away. Stop them now. Trump may have had an influence on Republicans in Congress, but they were already rejecting the bill. But look at the switcheroonie they're trying to pull off. The narrative is Trump, who wasn't in office, by the way, no position in Congress, convinced Republicans to reject the bill so he can prolong the border crisis and blame Democrats for it when he runs for president again. Wow, but now you're saying Trump doesn't really care about the border crisis because he rejected a bill that would, quote, secure the border for his own political gain. Not sure if you're going to convince anyone of that when the guy literally built a wall to secure the border, which Tim Walls, get a load of this guy, this same person, stated if Trump will build a 30-foot wall, then I'm gonna invest in 35-foot ladders then, and he will invest in a ladder factory. Of course, fact checkers came out, stumbling over themselves, attempting damage, damage control, control, but it was clear what his message was. And you don't need that for proof. His policies have proven it. And his running mate in Kamala Harris also stated that the border wall won't stop migrants from entering the country. She even laughed it off as a ludicrous idea. Again, this is all proof that the left wants open borders for cheap labor, for potential votes, and dare I say for drug trafficking, sex trafficking, and other crimes to destroy the country from within. The proof is right in front of our faces, being spewed out by Tim the Communists in the debate. You know, let's kind of wrap it up because I think that did him in. There was more, but there's no way to get out of that hellhole. Well, you know what? Let's add a little more gasoline to the burning walls. The CBS automaton moderators discussed abortion. Yeah, one of the Democrats' strongest weapons. But uh, Tim Walls couldn't take advantage of it and only prove they don't actually care about women's rights, rather use it for political pandering. But more importantly, they do not care about abortion rights, neither, which they claim to fight for. I'm going to skip down to the segment of the debate where Vance is asking Walls about a law he passed as governor of Minnesota. If you watched the debate, you remember the jitters Walls displayed when questioned about this. Vance, quote, may I respond to this? First of all, Governor, I agree with you. Amber Thurman should still be alive. And there are a lot of people who should still be alive. And I certainly wish that she was. And maybe you're free to disagree with me on this and explain this to me. But as I read the Minnesota law that you signed into law, the statute that you signed into law, it says that a doctor who presides over an abortion 
where the baby survives. The doctor is under no obligation to provide life-saving care to a baby who survives a botched late-term abortion. That is, I think whether it's not pro-choice or pro-abortion, that is fundamentally barbaric. And that's why I use that word Nora, is because some of what we've seen, do you want to force Catholic hospitals to perform abortions against their will? Because cause Kamala Harris has supported suing Catholic nuns to violate their freedom of conscience. We can be a big and diverse country where we respect people's freedom of conscience and make the country pro-baby and pro-family. But please, unquote. Now, before we continue, let's touch on Kamala Harris here. Harris has indeed supported efforts in pursuing legal action against Catholic hospitals that deny abortion services. The state of California currently is suing a Catholic church for denying abortion services. Now, this goes into the realm of, guess what? Dictatorship. Forcing businesses, organizations, churches to kneel down to your ideology, and if they don't, they either face criminal charges or financial losses. And Kamala Harris is right there egging the dictatorship on. Seems there is a candidate that is liking to Hitler, right? Also, on a side note, this seems to be the reason why Harris skipped the Al Smith annual dinner held for presidential candidates to roast each other. It's hosted by Catholics, yeah. Uh, Harris knew the sins she had committed and was afraid to come before the priest, not getting their support. But let's hear what Wacko Walls has to say. Quote, I've given this advice on a lot of things that getting involved, getting that's been misread, and it was fact-checked at the last debate. Okay, stop. This is the jitters. This is what Walls said verbatim. This is the transcript from the debate. I've given this advice on a lot of things that getting involved, getting that's been misread, uh, yeah, that's misread, because it doesn't make a lick of fucking sense what you just said. He's shaking in his war boots, because Vance exposed him for literally abandoning and essentially murdering infants after they survive botched abortions. He's so fucking finished. And it wasn't fact-checked in the last debate. We presented the evidence of a former Virginia governor and pediatrician who admitted it that practice was being carried out. Anywho, let's continue. But the point on this is there's a continuation of these guys to try and tell women or to get involved. Again, a fragmented sentence, which is a fragmented thought from a fragmented brain. I use this line on this. Just mind your own business on this. Okay, wait a minute. Just mind your own business. I'm assuming you tell the father of the child the same thing, huh? Oh, who cares if you're the father of the child and don't want it to be aborted? It's the woman's right. It's her body. Just mind your own damn business. I can imagine Walls' as governor having a conversation over dinner with his wacko political peers. Pathetic. I have to keep stopping. It's insane. Things work best when Roe v. Wade was in place. When we do a restoration of Roe, that works best. Okay. Again, how has that helped the lower class communities where the abortion rate in the black community is through the roof? Yeah, that doesn't preclude us from increasing funding for children. It doesn't decrease us from making sure that once that child's born, like in Minnesota, they get meals, they get early childhood education, they get health care. Yeah, you may provide those services for the, quote, normal children whose mother doesn't decide to abort them. But what about the infant that survives a botched abortion? Will you make sure that child receives that same care? Oh, wait. It's up to the doctor and the mother if they want to keep the child alive after being born. But wait a minute. You slipped and bumped your head, I see. Because the very concern you have for the children born by illegal immigrants, yeah, don't even have to finish it. Everyone knows where I'm going with that. Oh, let's continue. So the hiding behind, we're going to do all these other things. Fucking stop. Just stop. I can't fucking finish. He's talking like a, a moron. I know why. But it's unbelievable how stupid he sounds. So the hiding behind, we're going to do all these other things when you're not proposing them in your budget. Kamala Harris is proposing them. She's proposing all those things to make life easier for families. Unquote. I mean, how the hell? This is just, it's, it's, it's just, this is an historical embarrassment of U.S. politics. Just madness. Vance responds, quote, I asked a specific question, Governor, and you gave me a slogan as a response. Unquote. Tim Walls, quote, it's not the case. It's not true. That's not what the law says. So they fact-checked it with President Trump, unquote. Freudian slip, I see. Walls called Trump President Trump. And of course, the CBS automatons wanted to quickly get away from that segment because Walls passed a law that allowed doctors to murder children after a botched abortion. Yeah, says a lot about how much he cares for the children and Democrats as a whole. 
This was a better debate based on the exchanges between the two who were allowed to do so, but it was the worst debate for Democrats thus far, and that's competing with Harris and old Joe Pryor. It was the worst because the key issues for Democrats were strategically and brilliantly exposed by J.D. Vance. Democrats were infuriated because Walls constantly nodded his head in agreement of his opponent. He stated several times, most of what the senator has stated, I'm in agreement. Although in general, that shows class for the wacky Democrats, that's conceding defeat. Another devastating moment in the debate is when Vance poured more gasoline on the burning walls. When asked about the economy, Vance stated, quote, Honestly, Tim, I think you have a tough job here because you have to play guacamole. On one hand, you got to pretend that Donald Trump didn't deliver rising take-home pay regarding his tax cuts. You got to pretend Trump didn't lower inflation. And then you simultaneously got to defend Kamala Harris's atrocious economic record, which has made gas, groceries, and housing unaffordable for American citizens, unquote. That's what we call a political pretzel a thing of beauty if you're into hardcore political debates. Because it not only defends his running mate's economic policies, which are backed by the facts, but it puts Walls in a corner of not being able to defend his running mate's policies, which are backed by the facts. As a result, you end up with someone stuck in a corner as the American people witness a man incapable of responding. And he didn't include the border in that moment. That would have been an overkill. Quote, you have to pretend that Trump didn't have a strong border. Simultaneously, you have to defend Kamala Harris's atrocious economic record, which has made gas, groceries, and housing unaffordable for American citizens. And also, Tim, if that wasn't damaging enough, Harris also allowed millions of illegal immigrants into the country, which have raped young women and girls, murdered innocent civilians, and has had the red carpet rolled out for them to do so. Now we can disagree on a few things here and there, but you can't tell me that standing here on this stage in front of the American people that you can honestly defend Kamala Harris policies with a straight face." Unquote. Walls would have been even a bigger national headline story because he may have actually walked off the stage after being overwhelmed with facts. The vice president's job in the debate is to not only express their views on the subject matters, but also defend their presidential running mate and Walls couldn't do it because, for one, he's in the dark about his running mate in the first place. So he's oppressed with having no firm stance on her policies because she doesn't even have it. And he can't defend her record as vice president because that's a wash. And he also has his own problems as governor and military record, a complete and utter train wreck of a presidential ticket. Luckily for Walls, Vance took his foot off the gas because that may have become elder abuse if he didn't. His performance of sticking to the issues and challenging his opponent was the way a debate should be handled. And ironically, CBS allowed them to have those exchanges fairly well. I'll give them that because it opened up the book on walls a bit more and he was burned alive on the debate stage. Recently, Harris is demanding Trump have another debate. It's over, the American people have chosen the next president. The identity politics, the party time USA with wacky Hollywood celebrities, the socialistic policies, the first woman and first woman of color as president has not moved the voters. What moves the voters is safety and financial stability. And these two bird brains have shown they want the complete opposite. A clean sweep for Republicans, it seems. Trump beat up a senior citizen, then went on to casually beat Harris, and now his VP defeated Walls in a very civilized manner ensuring that if the American people would vote for such a ticket, they might as well stock up on magic markers and cardboard, they'll need it on the side of the road begging for money. And guess who will be driving by throwing loose change out of the window? Mario and Maria. This is the chaos sector.